Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Board Explorer Live. I'm reading J.B. Priestley's English story again, and um, I'm on chapter th three. So that's what we're going to read. I haven't got tea this morning. This morning I have coffee. Um, all a bit uh, dishevelled and a bit later than normal today because uh, we put the clocks back here in the UK last night. And uh, because of that, I went out this morning to do a, a video walk. It's a 20 minute walk. <clears throat> um, and I had to wait till... I suppose half past seven to go out and do my walk, whereas before I was doing it half past six, but because the lighting hasn't changed. Anyway, so that sort of put me an hour behind to uh, get other bits and pieces done. So hopefully my sight reading won't be so dreadful. We'll see how we go anyway. And of course, I'm not expecting that many people to be uh, watching because... Um, People are probably having a lie in, and I don't blame them, so I'm just setting up my microphone. So, a little bit behind the scenes. The great thing about the, uh, once this is recorded, people watching it can just sort of scoot, s scoot through on the, on the, whatever you call it, the timeline thing to get past all this early morning waffle. Uh, right, okay, well, thanks very much for joining me. If you have, I'm going to read anyway. Um, and thanks for the lovely messages of people saying that they would like me to continue. So this is chapter three, journey. Uh, J.B. Priestley's English Journey. I always start by saying this because I think it's quite uh, relevant um, because people might see this for the very first time and not know what the hell is going on. Uh, English Journey it being a rambling but truthful account of what one man saw and heard and felt and thought during a journey through England during the autumn of 1933. So, good morning, Dale M. Nice to see you there. So, here we go. Uh, this is um, chapter three, To the Cotswolds. Chipping Camden has a population of about 1,500, but it is a town and no village. It used to be a very prosperous town, the centre of the Cotswold wool trade and, later, of its silk manufacture. The whole of this region, though it seems now so Arcadian, is actually a depressed industrial area. It was once famous for its textiles. It had the wool, just as it has today. It had water power and plenty of soft water for dyeing. It had a good local supply of fuller's earth in the hillsides, and it was not far from the port of Bristol. The western area of the Cotswolds made broadcloth, which our grandfathers recognised as the best of all clothing fabrics. The other districts had their own specialities. To this day, the best blankets come from Whitney, just off the eastern edge of the Cotswolds. Even as late as 1801, a map of England showing the density of population includes this region in its most heavily shaded areas, with an average density of more than a 100 to the square mile. A similar map of modern England shows a bigger part of the region in its most lightly shaded division, with an average density of less than 128 persons to the square mile. There must have been many great districts that actually had far more people living in them in the Middle Ages than they have today, though now, when the road is rapidly triumphing over its former conqueror, the railway, many of those districts are beginning to fill up again. It was steam power, with its large-scale plants and reliance upon coal that packed people together, herding them into hundreds of narrow streets. If there had been a few thick seams of coal between Gloucester, Evesham and Sirencester, the Cotswolds would have been torn up and blackened and built over with brick horrors and would now be enjoying an industrial depression, far worse than anything it knew when steam power arrived to rob its ancient trade. 
As it is, the Cotswold is singularly remote, even from the railway, for only one line finds its way across these hills. It had its depression before the railway came, and no doubt had its painful problems too, with one little mill after another, one merchant after another, going out of business. But all that now is like an old bad dream, and there is Chipping Camden, not at all the important town it was when William Greville built his house in the high street, but exquisite in the sunlight, with no tall brick chimneys, no rows of hovels, no crowds of worth, worthless men, workless men. He went out of business at the right time and so escaped the grand uglification. It also escaped the new uglifying processes, which, beyond our age, is not an accident. The credit must be given to one or two of its citizens, notably Mr F. L. Griggs, the artist, who spent time, energy and money for the last 25 years keeping the place beautiful. Now, after a hard fight, the people themselves are ready to protect their town, which fortunately is still a real little town and not simply a show place and glorified tea establishment for tourists. There is no ye old Chipping Camden nonsense about it. When you look at the curved wide main street, you feel that such an unusual and exquisite harmony of line and colour in architecture could only have come from one particular period, almost from one particular mind. The secret, however, is that these Cotswolds towns and villages and manor houses are the products of a definite tradition. They were not all built at the same time. One building, some buildings are hundreds of years older than their neighbours. But the tradition persisted. Houses are always built of certain houses were always built of certain material in a certain way. If you told a Cotswold man to build you a house, this is how he built it. He knew, thank God, no other way of building houses. This tradition has lasted until our own time. There are still some old Cotswold masons who work in that tradition and could work in no other. In their hands, the stones flowers naturally into, these, into those mullions. They can see Cotswold houses already stirring in the very quarries. I say these men still exist, but there are not many of them, and they grow old and feeble. Just having a slurp of coffee. Ah, uh, thank you for joining me, by the way, those people who have. Sid Bonkers, Sarah, Cynthia's camera. And Judith, <clears throat> hope you're all having a nice sedate Sunday morning, like you have the rest of the week. I was introduced to old George, a Cotswold mason. He's in his 70s, but he's still at it. When I met him, he was engaged in the almost lost art of dry walling, pulling down some ramble, ramshackle old walls and converting their materials into smooth, solid ramparts. He was a little man with a dusty, puckered face and an immense upper lip so that he looked like a wise old monkey. And he had spent all his life among the stones. There were bits of stone all over him. He handled the stones about him, some of which he showed us, at once easily and lovingly as women handle their babies. He was like being that... He was like a being that had been created out of stone, a quarry gnome. He was a pious man, this old George, and when he was not talking about stone and walls, he talked in a very quiet yet evangelical strain about his religious briefs, which were beliefs which were old and simple. Thanks, that's my phone. Being a real craftsman, knowing that he could do something better than you or I, he obviously enjoyed his work, which was not so much toil in exchange for so many shillings, but full of expression of himself, his sign that he was old George, the mason, and still at it. Bad walls, not of his building, were coming down, and good walls were going up. 
The stones of them fitted squarely and smoothly and were a delight to the eye and a great contentment to the mind, so weary of shoddy and rubbish. I have never done anything in my life so thoroughly and truly as that old mason did with his building. If I could write this book or any other book as well as he could build walls, dry, honest, dry walls, I would be the proudest and happiest man alive. Old George has always been a mason, and his father and his grandfather were masons before him. They were all masons, these Georges. They built the whole Cotswolds, men of their hands, men with a trade, craftsmen. I do not know for what pittances they worked or how narrow and frugal their lives must have been, but I do know they were not unhappy men. They knew what they could do and they were allowed to do it and they, they weren't taught algebra and chemistry and then flung into a world that didn't even want their casual labour. They were not robbed of all the dignity and sweetness of real work. They did not find themselves lost and hopeless in a world that neither they nor anyone else could understand. They did not feel themselves to be tiny cogs in a vast machine that was running down. They had a good trade in their fingers, solid work to do, and when it was done and there it was, with no mistake about it, ready to outlast whole dynasties, they could take their wages and go home and be content. I'm glad I met old George and saw him at work. And if we ever do build Jerusalem in this green and pleasant land, I hope that he will be there, doing the dry walling. There are some grand old folk in these parts. By the famous old church at Camden, are some almshouses, ancient and mellowed. There, sunning himself at the door, I found old Bennett, well into his eighties and a big, fine figure of a man. He's, it's no use, it's, it's no use you, you're suggesting to old Bennett that Chipping Camden cannot have changed much. He knows better. It has changed a lot, he says grimly. They don't bake their own cakes any more there. They used to have three flour mills in the town, but now they've gone. The homemade bread was fine old stuff. Old Bennett is not the oldest there. Old Polly is over ninety and can still dance when she has a mind to it. A film company came round and took some shots of the almshouses and their old folk. They wanted old Polly to dance, but she wouldn't. Not, that is, until they'd gone. And then... She danced like mad. But they made a great fuss of her, put her in the middle and asked her to say something. This sudden film stardom had unusual results. Er, wouldn't talk to us for the next two or three weeks, said old Bennett grimly. He told us that they had given... He told us that they had been given for their posing a ten-shilling paper which I suppose is what you may expect from a man who has spent most of his long life among solid metal coins. He doesn't call them a ten-shilling note. Not he. A ten-shilling paper. That's his verdict. I went out one evening to a typical Cotswold farmhouse, whose owner is a large, genial fellow. In his parlour, which was like a farmhouse parlour anywhere in this island, he did his bit of grumbling, but when I pressed him, he had to confess that he was not so badly off. He kept sheep on his high ground, raised crops in the valley, and had been and had between 60 and 80 cows, though most of his butter came from New Zealand. He'd grown up with two sons, <coughs> sorry, he had grown up two sons with him and about a dozen men. He, object, he objected to the compulsory minimum wages on the ground that there was a vast difference between a good-willing man and a slack one, and while he had no objection of paying a good man more than the minimum, he begrudged paying the poor hand even the minimum. He told me that the Cotswolds that he knew were, the, were, were best and returning more and more to general farming, except on the hills where sheep farming was still the rule. The young men had quite glad now the young men were quite glad now to stay on the land and earn their six and thirty shillings a week. He got his weather now from the wireless, 
but added it didn't seem any more accurate than the prophecies of his oldest shepherd, who was a very cunning in these matters. When he'd given me a whisky and himself a gin, he told me about the old Cotswolds games they used to have on Whit Sunday on the neighbouring hill. One of them was a shin kicking contest. The competitors, who must have been hardy fellows, placed their hands on each other's shoulders and then, at a signal from the referee, hacked away at each other's shins. And then there was cudgel play at these games, up to, fa up to a fairly late date. They began very early and probably Shakespeare walked from Stratford to see them. How does your fellow greyhound, sir? says Justice Shallow. I heard he was outrun on Cotswold. There was a mighty sport on Cotswold for centuries, and if there was anything in that way now, my farmer would be the man for it. Once he'd had his bit of once he'd had his bit of grumbling, he livened up wonderfully, and was the best of company. I told him that he was safer than anybody in the world these days, for if the worst came to the worst, and his he and his family could sit there smugly, a good old roof over their heads, living on their produce and livestock. The farm was his own, he was in nobody's debt, the land was there working for him, and he did not live like the rest of us in a world of paper. In the end, he was asking me to find a neighbouring manor house in which to live. You'll like it, he assured me earnestly. They do tell me it's very, it's a very pretty bit of country we've got round here. He spoke as if he'd never seen another bit of countryside besides this. And where indeed would he find better country, so long as he didn't mind the spells of sullen weather? Another slurp of coffee, I feel. How are we doing? Morning from Manchester. Good morning to you. Good morning, Mr Hammond. Seems to have got a slightly runny nose this morning. Not runny as in a cold nose, but because I went out for a walk and have hastily come back here... It's, you know, the, the body is still pumping stuff round. It hasn't quite settled down for a nice, quiet bit of reading. <clears throat> I didn't look for a manor house for myself, but I visited several charming old houses, in each of which was a Cotswold enthusiast, ready, if need be, to serve on pro protection committees and even spend money in defence of the district's amenities. The odd thing was that not one of these was a Cotswold man. Some of them had come from afar. Thus, one of them was a New Englander. Another was a rich man from Lancashire, who, having once deserted the blackened bricks of Oldham and Burnley, treated his Cotswold village as if it was a collection of precious objects, which indeed it is. With these men, it was not the usual social snobbery that set the wheels of interest and charity in motion, they had all genuinely succumbed to the Cotswold charm, the green hills, the strangely remote little valleys, the luminous old stone, had claimed them for their own. The spell was upon them, and would be until they died. When I was there I heard much talk about the open log fires of the haunted woods and spectral appearances in the lanes. And indeed, this is a ghostly region. But what fascinated me was the magic that had touched these solid middle-aged men and kept them in thrall. There were a lot. They were lost forever among these Gloucestershire hills, dream-drowned in their green valleys. Consider how artful the guardian spirits of this region must have been. They would not allow it to be drawn into the ugly scramble for quick profits, and so have kept its charm intact, its beauty unravaged. But when they have found it needing money, they have laid their spell upon rich men from the black holes of industry, and by showing them a manor house lacking a tenant, a village wanting a, pa a patron, and having conjured up They've conjured up the money out of them, so that many a prospect here is unspoilt and exquisite because of the muck and sweat of Birmingham and Manchester. There's real magic for you, and I watched it at work. 
Perhaps it was the guardian spirits of the region who lured me into playing that visit on the last day, a visit that still haunts me and retains a certain magical quality of its own. A friend asked me if I cared to see yet another manor house owned by a very charming but rather eccentric gentleman. The prospect did not excite me, but as I had arranged nothing else, I agreed and off we went. We had to pass through Broadway, now, I suppose, the best known of all the Cotswolds villages. The guardian spirits have left this place to their own devices, and those devices are not very pleasing. In short, Broadway is ye old game. The morning we passed, it was loud with bright young people who had just arrived from town, and the tattler in Gamboge and Verilin sports cars. I noticed that, w that one of the old shops proudly announced that it was established in the 90s. Even the other Broadway, which sends so, mi so many visitors here, could do better than that. However, this anything but deserted village was soon left behind, and then we crept into one of those green little valleys that at once make you feel oddly remote, miles and miles from anywhere, clean out of the world. It's easy enough to feel remote in the wild mountainous country, but the Cotswolds are not wild and mountainous, yet you only have to take a turn or two from the main road here into one of these enchanted little valleys, these misty cups of verdure and grey walls, and you are gone and lost, somewhere at the end of space and dubiously situated, even and dubiously situated even in time, with all four dimensions wrecked behind you. The map may tell you that you are only so many miles from Broadway or Cheltenham, but you do not need the elaborate dubities of the mathematician and astronomers to tell you that the map is a mere convention and not the fantastic truth. This, then, was one of those valleys, and one of the best of them, looking as if it had decided to detach itself from the rest of England about the time of the Civil War. The day was brilliant above, but below there was a very faint haze on, over everything, so that the hillsides and trees and walls had that gauzy, gleaming look which belongs to the unreality and enchantment of theatre. In this valley was a hamlet, an old church and the manor house, that was our destination, all of them clustered together in a lovely huddle of ancient tiled roofs. The moment we were inside the gate and could see the manor house, I knew that anything might happen now, that we were trembling on the very edge of common reality and that life might turn into a beautiful, daft fairy tale under our very noses. The house itself had gothic craziness. There was no sense through the... There was no sense, though an infinite antique charm in its assembled oddity of roofs, gables, windows and doorways. It might have been plucked straight out of one of Hoffman's tales. You caught glimpses of such houses in the old silent films of the Uffer Company when it allowed its producers to be as romantic and symbolic as they pleased. There was a tiny courtyard between the house proper and the large outhouse, which had on its wall a painted wooden knight whose hand was waiting to strike a big bell. In this courtyard were a score or so of white pigeons that rose and fluttered as our approach, so that for a second there seemed to be a blizzard raging. When the last pigeon had gone creaking to the roof, the courtyard and the manor house, the whole valley again, sank into a deep quiet. Not a mouse stirred. Round the walls were coats of arms and painted inscriptions. Beyond the outhouse were descending squares of garden, where a stream wandered from one clear carp pond to another, slipping past clumps of miniature box, marger... marger... I can never say that, marjoram, you know what I mean, and rue and rhyme, and the shadow of the ewes. 
Olivier, Olivia and Malvolio, whoever they might be, some classical references, I assume, in 1933, Olivia and Malvolio would have been at home anywhere in this garden. Maybe they're Shakespearean characters, I don't know. We could not find its contemporary owner of whom the garden at the gate whom the gardener at the gate had only the vaguest news. But I began to fancy there was no such person, or at or at best he would turn out to be a ghost. And when we did at last meet him, though he spoke and behaved like a very courteous and charming English gentleman of leisure, I could not rid myself of this fancy which was sustained by the fact that his clothes and general appearance were not the clothes and general appearance of a contemporary person. He was, in fact, one of the last of a famous company, the eccentric English country gentry, the odd and delightful fellows who have lived just as they pleased, who have built follies, held fantastic beliefs and laid mad wagers. But why English? Was there not Don Quixote? <clears throat> could You could have settled him into this house in a jiffy. I'd half expected to meet him. The owner, then, in a most charming fashion, conducted us over his house. He didn't live there, but in the outhouse. The manor itself was now used as a sort of museum. The inside was as crazy as the outside, and as beautiful in its own way. We looked into an ancient dim panelled room, in which there were collections of spinning wheels, sedan, sedan chairs, model wagons, sedan chairs of course, model wagons, weapons, old musical instruments. You ought to have seen the black wooden serpents and blazing lacquer from Peking. One room was filled with old costumes, cupboard after cupboard of gowns, crinolines, uniform coats, bonnets, beaver hats, cockades. You could have dressed the whole opera company out of that room. I've never seen such a collection outside the a public museum. He then took us over the outhouse where he had his bachelor living room and workshop. They looked at first glance like the early illustrations to the old curiosity shop. It is only those Dickens illustrations that can give you an, any idea of the amazing litter of things in these queer ramshackle rooms. There were tools and implements of every kind, coats of arms, skulls, black letter folios, painted saints, colossal tomes of plain song, swords and daggers, wooden platters, and I know not what else. Neither in one house nor the other did I catch the smallest glimpse of a modern book or a newspaper or anything else that belonged to our own age. The 20th century was nowhere in evidence, and the 19th had only just dawned there. But the owner no longer spent his time collecting these relics of the past. His hobby now was the construction of a whole ministry... <coughs> Excuse me. His construction now was of a whole miniature old-fashioned seaport. Boys play on a smashing adult scale, defying all common sense, but glorious in its absorption in the exquisitely useless. This miniature seaport, which must have been on the scale of about an inch to a foot, for most of the houses were about two feet high, has a proper harbour in one of the ponds in the garden. It has a quay, its fleet of ships, its lighthouse, its railway system with station, sidings and all, its inn, main street and side streets, thatched cottages and actual living woods made up of the dwarf trees in the garden. The owner, who has some architectural training, has designed, built and painted the whole village himself. It is portable, except for the harbour works, and it is brought out and erected in the garden in the summer and then taken into the house in the winter. Its creator has now decided that it should have a castle and he showed us some excellent and preliminary drawings of this imposing building, which will be several feet long and will easy, easily dominate the place. I hope there'll be no trouble in the village 
with the two-inch lord of the castle, for by the time the, pa the place may have settled down an easy democratic, to an easy democratic existence, it may re resent this sudden descent into the feudal system. The Lillip Lilliputian seaport, which has a name, is still so real in my name that I could easily write a novel about it. I know that if I have a chance, I shall have to go there again and see what's happening to it in the shadow of that castle above which I am. I shall be able. I shall be able to tower gigantically like Gulliver himself, and if I have no opportunity of seeing it again, I am glad to have seen it once. It crowned the day for me. Most excursions of this kind, which begin with such promise, offering you some remote valley, some village or house, drowned in lost time, so many signposts to what will be supremely odd and romantic, have a bad trick of fizzling out. But not this one, which became curiouser and curiouser, until at last, at the other side of the moon, we landed at the seaport, that was two feet high in a harbour where goldfish, fat fellows of nine inches or so, came glittering out like whales of red gold. So much for fancifulness and fine writing. But I am here, in a time of stress, to look at the face of England, however blank or bleak that face may chance to appear, and to report truthfully what I see here. I know there is deep distress in the country. I have seen some of it, just had a glimpse of it already, and I know that there is far, far more ahead of us. We need a rational economic system, not altogether removed from austerity. Without such a system, we shall soon perish. All hands must be on deck. My eccentric but charming friend of the fantastic manor house, who lives an antique dream of life, supported by an unearned income, cannot possibly counted as a hand on deck. Would there be any justification for such an existence in any rational economic system? The answer is obviously none whatever. It would be very easy to denounce and dismiss this leisurely gentleman and all his two toys in a few sentences. And there are thinkers, I admire, who would not hesitate to do it, but I cannot bring myself to do it. The system, however rational it may be, must somehow be stretched to fit him in. Manor house, museum, hotchpotch, toy village and all. I'm glad he is at play under those crazy roofs in that green cup among the hills. And would not have him sent to the and would not have him sent to clerk in the gasworks or draw plans for communal garages. It is not such it is not such as he who will is it not such as he who will bring their own charm and poetry to life, however withdrawn and eccentric they may be, that I would dub an anachronism and promptly extinguish. After all, he makes no noise, he does not lust for power, is no braggard or bully. Moreover, he does not live a herd life, but shows us what we are beginning to need to be shows us what we are now beginning need beginning to need to be shown that is an original experiment in living we may not want to live it ourselves a month in that manor house would be more than enough for me after i should be after <clears throat> after that i'll be ready for the gas works or a communal garage but we are glad to know that such experiments are being made that all eccentrics are not dead and gone and I suspect that the system that rigid, rigidly excludes him will prove to be too narrow for the good life, which would not be good if it banned the mild dreamer and his antique trifles and his toy villages. I know, because I know because that was a good day, I feel its heartening quality yet. The light it left in my mind was a little dim, with willow the wisps but it has since seen me through some dark places. Not sure I read that last bit terribly well, but there we are. That's, um, that's pretty much all I'm going to do today. Um, I do try to read very quickly the, you know, the, I read the chapter beforehand, like a few days ago, and then I tried to read it an hour or so before, so I 
familiarise myself with the text. Um, <clears throat> but I it was read, read that last bit pretty badly. Apologies for that. Anyway, um, that's a, a, another bit. There's a there's plenty more to keep us going. I hope you're enjoying that. Uh, many people have said they are. I know not everybody can join me when I do it live, but if you have, thank you very much. It's um, it's been a thrill. I hope that you have a great Sunday as I record this. Um, and I have been out for a walk, so I shall go and edit up that. Finish my coffee and uh, see what the rest of the day. Philip Hammond says, um, you didn't tell me you were live. Uh, yeah, now I've been doing this, this is uh, day four, is it? Day four of reading the book. I do the book every morning at 9.30. It gives me something to focus. That's my phone, someone's hailing me, so I better go. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. Take care one and all, and I will, uh, don't forget I should be doing a live Vogue show live tonight at eight o'clock and hopefully there'll be a, another video for you to enjoy on the Bald Explorer pages um, this afternoon. Thanks very much and bye for now. Bye bye.